Rachel Cook was a brilliant and beautiful young woman who had big dreams and lofty goals. Born and raised in Georgetown, Texas, her love of life and her focus on fashion would take her to Southern California, where she attended school with a keen eye set on a bright future. While her family worried about her being out there in the big world, it would be her own small town that would ultimately provide the greatest threat against her safety. Rachel returned home in the winter of 2001, planning to stay through the holidays and then a few extra days to attend her cousin's wedding. Her boyfriend at the time had traveled with her, but returned to Southern California just before New Year's, and so Rachel had approximately two weeks to spend just with her family. In preparation for the wedding, she made arrangements to go shopping with her father and then spend the evening with close friends from high school. Everything appeared to be just another normal family visit, but things would dramatically change. An avid runner, Rachel woke up on the morning of January 10, 2002, planning to follow her normal morning routine of running several miles to get her day jump-started. She exited the family home sometime after 9 a.m. and never returned. When her family realized what had happened later that day, they searched everywhere for Rachel before filing a report with the local sheriff's department. Rachel's disappearance was a shock to the community that had never experienced a crime of this nature, and it would be forever transformed. Over the course of the next 16 years, Rachel's case would have its ups and downs. Hundreds of individuals were interviewed, cars were searched and their owners questioned, a convicted killer would confess to the crime and then recant his entire statement. Tips about a plot of land where a body was alleged to be buried poured in, and multiple digs were conducted. Then, in 2018, a vehicle was impounded by the sheriff's department and may still yet lead to answers in this devastating and heartbreaking disappearance. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 64, The Disappearance of Rachel Cook. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine the disappearance of Rachel Cook from Georgetown, Texas in January of 2002. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focusing on a different unsolved case each week. Subscribe and listen via Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and all of your favorite podcatchers. If you have questions, comments, or case suggestions, email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter at traceevpod, on Instagram at traceevidencepod, or join the Facebook discussion group simply by searching for Trace Evidence. You can visit the website at trace-evidence.com for full episodes, social media links, merchandise, and more. Trace Evidence is also on Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence, where you can get rewards such as stickers, pins, and commercial-free episodes. There's also a PayPal donation link on the website for those of you who don't wish to go through Patreon. This show is a complete one-man operation, and your support is greatly appreciated. Today we examine the disappearance of Rachel Cook. It's a disturbing and haunting story that devastated a family and forever changed a small town in Texas. There are many twists and turns in this story, and with each comes another heartbreaking revelation. This is Episode 64, The Disappearance of Rachel Cook. Rachel Louise Cook was born on May 10, 1982, to parents Robert and Janet Cook. Rachel was their first child, followed several years later by another daughter, Joanne. The Cook family were settled in a ranch-style house in Georgetown, Texas, 
some 30 miles north of Austin. Their home, located in the North Lake subdivision, was one of many seated on a plot of land and set back a ways from the road. Georgetown is the county seat of Williamson County and home to the oldest university in Texas, Southwestern University. At the time, Georgetown was comprised of 24.9 square miles, though later the city would annex additional land growing to 54.3 square miles. Regardless of its land mass, Georgetown maintained a small town feel, the kind of place where everyone knew one another. It was a quiet town, a lot of neighborhoods centered around surrounding landscapes used for farming. In the Cook's own words, it was a safe town, a place where they never worried about locking their doors, and as such, was the perfect place to raise a family. Growing up in Georgetown provided a calm and nurturing environment for Rachel. Her father worked as a software engineer and had a more logical and calculated personality, while her mother was a teacher at nearby Georgetown High School, where Rachel would later attend, and added a more emotional and creative mindset. The combination of her parents' personalities and the environment of Georgetown itself certainly lent itself to Rachel's development, and from an early age, it was clear that she had a blend of both sensibilities. It became apparent early on that Rachel was intelligent, creative, and driven. She had dreams and goals, and even as a young girl, she was open about what she wanted to do with her life. In addition to being a dreamer, Rachel was very active. Growing up in the rural area, She had plenty of opportunities to play outside, explore, and it wasn't uncommon for the young woman to spend her days running around and laughing until the sun went down. According to friends and family, Rachel had a bright, cheery, and kind personality. The imprint of her small town was certainly present as she was known to politely greet everyone she came across. One key facet of her personality was her sense of humor, and by all accounts, Rachel had a unique ability to make others laugh. Her charisma was undeniable, and friends described her as the type that magnetically drew others immediately to her. One of her first friends with whom she would stay close throughout her life was Shannon Leach. Shannon later described Rachel, stating, quote, Rachel and I met at probably, I think we were about five years old, and she was just one of those people you loved to be around. She was funny and beautiful and just a good person, end quote. While a lover of the outdoors and possessing a natural talent for athleticism, Rachel was far from one-dimensional. Beyond her love of playing outside, she also had a keen eye for fashion and from a young age was fascinated by it. She enjoyed throwing together different outfits, making herself up, and as she grew older, Fashion was just an area she would find herself more strongly drawn towards. Shannon would later explain, quote, She just always looked beautiful in whatever she did, because she could create these outfits that nobody else could get away with, and it would just always look amazing on her. End quote. Her athleticism itself continued to develop as well, and soon, Rachel began to realize that she was pretty good at running, and beyond that, she thoroughly enjoyed it. Her father later explained that Rachel's love of running was just a part of her, and as the years passed, she found that she could run faster and go further than many of her classmates. When she entered high school, Rachel ran both long-distance track and cross-country. It became a part of Rachel's daily routine to run. In the morning hours, she would get dressed in her running gear, throw on a pair of headphones, and run all around her neighborhood. She knew it like the back of her hand, and she felt safe and secure there. Along the way, she would greet neighbors, stop for stretches, and eventually circle back to the family home. Her runs were hardly short trips, with her mother Janet later explaining that it was completely normal for Rachel to run four to six miles each day. These runs, aside from keeping her in shape, opened up Rachel's soul. She loved being out there, moving at her own pace, setting her own goals and then breaking them. 
Unfortunately, Rachel's love for running will ultimately play a role in her mysterious and devastating disappearance. As Rachel neared the end of her high school career, her magnetic personality was enhanced by her own beauty. According to friends, she was constantly being pursued by men who were drawn in by her looks and enchanted by her personality. She dated a few different boys, though one would later result in a difficult breakup, which has since been a source of controversy. When she was 18, Rachel made a decision which surprised others. Although she was well known to be fashion forward and glamorous, she had never been much of one for pageantry or competitions based on looks. However, she entered into the Miss Georgetown competition. Although she wouldn't win, it was something she had always wanted to try, something she had always wanted to be a part of. Janet later explained that Rachel didn't care that she lost, she was just happy to have been involved in it. Now, a senior in high school, she began looking at colleges and ultimately settled on one which would take her far from home, all the way to San Diego, California. At the time, her parents were torn on her choice as, while they wanted her to achieve all of her goals and pursue her dreams, they were worried about her safety. She had grown up in such a tight-knit community, the transition to California, they feared, may be difficult and dangerous. They couldn't possibly have known that it would be her hometown where Rachel would ultimately face her greatest danger. Either way, Rachel was set in her ways and determined to follow her path. She confirmed her decision to head for Southern California, and in the weeks leading up to moving on, she broke off her relationship with her then-boyfriend. While details regarding this breakup are scattered for the most part, it appears that Rachel simply didn't feel fulfilled by the relationship and also didn't believe that it would work out long distance. She needed to be free to build a future. Rachel would attend San Diego Mesa College, a two-year community college in the Claremont Mesa community. She planned to attend school, achieve a two-year degree, and following that, she had spoken about continuing her education by pursuing a career in fashion, a decision which didn't come as a surprise to those who knew her love for fashion. San Diego was almost as different from Georgetown as the surface of Mars would be. San Diego was the eighth largest city in the United States, boasting a population of 1.5 million residents. And while things in Georgetown may have been small town, quiet, and tight-knit, San Diego offered different options. An exciting nightlife, a blending of cultures and the opportunity to meet different people and experience an entirely different world. According to Janet and Robert, Rachel absolutely loved it there, and while she could sometimes be a little homesick for Texas, she knew that the hustle and bustle of San Diego was where she wanted to be. While out west, Rachel began a new relationship with a young man named Greg. The two had met through school, and it was clear early on that sparks were flying. Their relationship was based on mutual admiration and respect, and Rachel's parents highly approved of Greg and his treatment of their daughter. Janet would later state, quote, He was a super guy. He was very attentive to her, very sympathetic to her about her desires for her future, her dreams, end quote. As the relationship developed, it grew more serious, and both Rachel and Greg began to wonder if this might be it. When Rachel would return home for breaks and holidays, she would be in constant contact with Greg, and in December of 2001, when she was heading home for the holiday season, She brought Greg along with her to spend some time with her family and friends. It was during this time that Rachel confessed to her sister, Joanne, that she thought Greg was the one, and she was hopeful that they might get engaged. The couple planned, upon their return to California, to move in together. Rachel was going to enroll in a fashion design program, and the couple was going to begin building their life together. Tragically, Rachel would never make it back to California. Home for the holiday season of 2001, Rachel was back into her routine. She went out for her morning runs, but this time would come home to spend time with her family and Greg. 
Originally, Rachel's plan involved staying through Christmas, and then she'd be returning to California with Greg sometime around New Year's. However, while back home in Texas, Rachel began discussing her cousin's upcoming wedding and made the decision that she wanted to stay in town a little longer so she could attend. Of course, for the fashion-forward Rachel, this presented a problem. She hadn't brought an outfit with her that she considered a likely candidate to attend the wedding, and so she made arrangements with her father to go shopping one afternoon. Greg returned to California just prior to New Year's and told Rachel that he'd call her. The two were very excited for their plans for the new year and beginning the process of creating a life together. For Rachel, now in Texas, just with her family, she reached out to her best friend Shannon and made plans to get together on the evening of Thursday, January 10th, the same day that she planned to go shopping with her father in the afternoon. On Tuesday, January 8th, Rachel attended a local party where many of her friends from high school were. According to multiple witnesses at the party that night, Rachel's ex-boyfriend was also present and began harassing her. Attendees noted that her ex-boyfriend had been drinking, and while the conversation had begun casually, as time went on, he began expressing to Rachel his desire to get back together. Rachel was kind but firm, explaining that she'd moved on with her life and was seeing somebody new. One of the statements which has been reported multiple times is that this ex-boyfriend is alleged to have said that he didn't want to live without Rachel. Ultimately, Rachel managed to get away from him and made it home safely, but the incident had been difficult for her. It wasn't in her nature to be cold or rude, but her ex had forced her into a corner where she felt she had to be firm with him. This argument would later be a source of suspicion in relation to Rachel's disappearance. Thursday, January 10th, began as many other days had. Rachel's father, mother, and sister sat at the table eating breakfast, while Rachel herself was asleep on the couch. The family had their normal morning banter, and it was Robert who would leave first, heading into work at approximately 8 a.m. When he left the house, Rachel was still asleep. Janet and Joanne would be the next to leave, though Janet wanted to let Rachel know that they would be heading out for the day. She later explained that she walked over and told Rachel goodbye, and that Rachel just kind of mumbled and said good morning and goodbye. Joanne attended the high school where her mother worked, so the two would ride in together, as they normally did. According to their account, they left the home sometime before 9am, and Rachel was slowly waking up though she hadn't gotten off the couch by the time they left. Rachel's cell phone records indicate that she received a call from Greg, who was back in San Diego, around 9 a.m. During the conversation, the two chatted casually, and Rachel explained that she was going to get up, change into her running clothes, and go out for her normal morning jog. This would be the last time anyone can confirm speaking with Rachel, and according to records, the call ended at 9.15 a.m. In preparation for her run, Rachel dressed herself in a green sports bra, a gray shirt which she would later tie around her waist, gray shorts and white shoes, either Adidas or Asics. As had been her habit since youth, she also took a bright yellow Sony Walkman and headphones along with her to listen to the radio while she ran. The exact time that Rachel left the family home cannot be known for certain, but it is believed that she never re-entered the house. Robert was the first member of the family to return home that day at approximately 3 p.m. He'd previously made arrangements with Rachel to take her shopping, so when he entered the home and found it vacant, he thought it was a little unusual. According to Robert, he called out Rachel's name but received no answer. Upon entering the living room, he found several of Rachel's dresses and multiple pairs of shoes spread out and lined up as if she were attempting to decide what to wear later that day. Robert wasn't immediately worried and assumed that Rachel may have made plans with a friend and gotten picked up, but then he spotted her purse and cell phone. Rachel rarely went anywhere without her purse and phone, and to Robert, this indicated that something wasn't right. 
His first thought was to call Shannon, Rachel's best friend, and find out if she had met up with Rachel or had any idea where she may have gone. Shannon later explained, quote, He asked me if I had talked to her, and I said no, but we were planning on going out later, and he told me that she was gone, but that none of her stuff was gone, and everybody that knew Rachel knew that she didn't go anywhere without her personal belongings, especially her makeup. So right when he told me that, I started to get really worried. End quote. When Janet arrived home, Robert asked her if she knew where Rachel might be. According to Janet, she had no reason to believe Rachel was going anywhere that day. However, when Rachel is in town, she often works shifts at a nearby restaurant called Wildfire, and so Janet thought it was possible she agreed to work a shift that day and had simply forgotten her purse and phone. After calling the restaurant, Janet spoke with an employee and asked them if Rachel was scheduled to work. The employee explained that Rachel was working that evening, and so Janet assumed that Rachel had simply gone to work and forgotten her things. This, for the moment, diffused the tension. Not thinking too much about it, the family went about their normal business, but by the next morning, any shade of a normal life would be forever disturbed. The family awoke the next morning, Friday, January 11th, to find that Rachel hadn't returned. The couch was vacant and her items were undisturbed, and this immediately sent a chill of panic racing through them all. Janet once again picked up the phone and called the restaurant to confirm that Rachel had in fact worked the night before, but at this time, she learned that there had been some confusion with her previous call. The employee who had spoken to her the day before and stated that Rachel was working had made a mistake. A different woman named Rachel was working that night, not Rachel Cook. And for the first time, the Cook family became aware that no one had seen Rachel since the previous morning, and for nearly 24 hours, she had been unaccounted for. In a desperate search for answers or clues, the family began going through Rachel's belongings. It didn't take them long to discover that the only items of clothing missing were those that Rachel wore when she went for her morning runs. At that time, Robert and Janet decided to go out looking separately. Robert planned to drive Rachel's normal jogging path on the off chance that she may have been injured, or worse yet, hit by a car, while Janet visits the local hospital to check if Rachel may have been transported there. Robert drove around the neighborhood multiple times, slowing down, looking into fields and off the side of the road, but he never saw anything related to Rachel. At the hospital, Janet was told that Rachel wasn't listed as a patient and they didn't have any unidentified female patients arrive within the past few days. Frustrated, worried, and concerned, Robert and Janet both returned home, where they made the decision to go down to the Williamson County Sheriff's Department to file a missing persons report. For Georgetown, this was a rare occurrence. The Sheriff's Department was used to dealing with minor issues, bar fights, teenagers causing problems and the occasional stolen car, but a missing person in the little town was unheard of. While filling out the report and speaking with detectives, the Cook family began to get the impression that their claims weren't being taken seriously. According to Robert, the Sheriff's Department tried to convince them that Rachel likely wasn't missing and the whole situation may just be a mix-up. He later explained, quote, They said that she was off in Mexico, probably with her boyfriend, and she'd be home any minute, and that was discouraging. End quote. After filling out the report, Robert and Janet are advised that someone from the Sheriff's Department will be in touch with them. However, as the hours began passing on Friday and no one called, they didn't just want to sit around waiting. They were aware of how important every second was when it comes to a missing person, and so they began making phone calls. Not only were they asking if anyone has seen Rachel, but they begin to organize a search party for the next morning. As many people as they can get to volunteer, they're willing to have, and the plan involves walking the path that Rachel would have jogged, as well as covering every square inch of land surrounding it. They managed to gather a large group of volunteers, and the next morning, they were out searching the area when, finally, 
an investigator from the sheriff's department arrived on the scene. His first order of business was to stop the search party. According to Janet, the investigator was upset because all of these people were now walking all over multiple areas that could be connected to Rachel's disappearance, and any evidence present could easily be damaged or lost in the process. With the sheriff's department now involved, their first order of business was to conduct interviews in the neighborhood in an attempt to establish a timeline for when exactly Rachel may have vanished. As luck would have it, several neighbors did report seeing Rachel that day. Two separate couples who were walking in the area saw Rachel at different points in time. She passed one couple twice, first at approximately 10 a.m. and again around 10.20. A neighbor who was working in her garden, along with her daughter, spotted Rachel at the end of a cul-de-sac, stretching. They made eye contact with her, at which point Rachel waved to them before beginning to jog once again. The last confirmed sighting came from a couple who actually knew the Cook family and lived just a few hundred yards away. According to their statement, they were backing out of their driveway when Rachel jogged past the back of their vehicle. As they proceeded into the street, they noted that Rachel was heading towards the Cook home. It was 10.45 a.m. and she was less than 200 yards from her family's property. There are no further sightings of Rachel the day she disappeared. There were, however, reports of other people and vehicles in the area which were unfamiliar. The North Lake subdivision in which the Cook family lived was not a busy one. For the most part, vehicles entering and exiting the area were easily identifiable as residents. It was rare to see someone driving around who wasn't known by someone nearby, but on this particular day, multiple witnesses reported unidentified individuals in the area. Several witnesses noted seeing a late model white Camaro or Trans Am. For others, they reported a similar vehicle but described it as being blue. Sheriff's Detective Larry Hawkins later stated, quote, A white Camaro was seen in the area. We actually lost count of how many reports of a white Camaro we had come into the tip line. End quote. The driver was described as male, late teens to early 20s, with dark, slicked back hair, and at least one witness reported seeing him speaking to a jogger that morning. It was never confirmed whether or not this jogger was Rachel or someone else. Other witnesses reported seeing a second male inside the vehicle as well. One witness reported seeing a female in the back seat of the vehicle in the midst of some kind of a struggle, though this person couldn't positively identify this woman as Rachel. Another vehicle seen in the area that morning was a white pickup truck in the subdivision. According to several witnesses, this truck had been driving around the area that morning and, at some point, had slowed down next to a young woman who was jogging and seemed to be trying to speak with her. Again, this jogger was never confirmed to have been Rachel, but based upon all accounts, there was not a large number of women jogging around the neighborhood that morning, and for the most part, it is considered a good possibility that the jogger was Rachel. All of the incidents involving the car and the truck speaking with the jogger took place in the hours after Rachel is confirmed to have left the Cook family home that morning. After conducting interviews, establishing a timeline, and receiving reports of suspicious vehicles in the area, the sheriff's department made two decisions. First, they would run record searches for vehicles matching those descriptions in the area in an attempt to track down who may have been in the neighborhood that morning. Secondly, they placed a call into the Texas Rangers and requested assistance with the case. While it was initially believed that it may have simply been a mix-up or that this was not likely an abduction or disappearance, all of the evidence seemed to indicate that Rachel had not left of her own volition and something criminal had likely taken place. A massive search of the area was also planned for the following day, Sunday, January 13th and they would be joined by investigator Matthew Lindemann of the Texas Rangers. While the family had been displeased by the sheriff's department's initial response, 
Lindemann was clear with them that he believed foul play had been involved here, and at least, for the most part, the family felt that this would ensure a proper investigation was conducted. The search began early in the morning on Sunday and involved the Williamson County Sheriff's Department along with assistance from multiple other law enforcement agencies in the area. The search would be both land and air, with investigators utilizing ATVs, horses, and helicopters. Foot searches were also conducted, and tracking dogs were brought in. In addition to law enforcement personnel, investigators were joined by members of EquiSearch, as well as local volunteers. Despite an exhaustive search, which spanned the course of multiple days, covering the entire North Lake subdivision and surrounding areas, no sign of Rachel was discovered, not even a single shred of her clothing, or anything to indicate that she'd even been in the area the day she vanished. For investigators, it was incredibly frustrating, and Detective Hawkins later expressed that, stating, quote, "'You have a person who basically vanished. We have absolutely no evidence of a crime scene at all. There's no evidence on the road, no evidence in the house. There's no evidence anywhere that anything even happened to her." End quote. After several days, law enforcement called off the official search, but volunteers and members of EquiSearch continued combing over the area, spinning out in wider and wider radiuses each time. In total, Several hundred square miles were examined inch by inch. Any items found which were believed to have been connected to Rachel were turned in, though none of these items led investigators to any tips or clues. With the case now expanding, local media got involved, and through their coverage of Rachel's disappearance, thousands of tips began pouring in to the sheriff's department. Investigators conducted hundreds of interviews with both witnesses and potential persons of interest, though again, none of this led anywhere. One target, early on, was Rachel's ex-boyfriend, but according to detectives, there was simply no evidence to link him to Rachel's disappearance, nor were there any witnesses who had seen him or his vehicle in the area that day. Joanne, however, was unconvinced, stating, quote, my sister had mentioned that she had seen her ex-boyfriend, and she didn't go into detail with me, but she had mentioned that he made a scene. My intuition tells me that it's not unreasonable to think that he could have had a fight with her and something happened." End quote. Janet later recounted a previous incident with the ex-boyfriend where he had come to the family home, drunk and belligerent, banging on the door at 3 a.m. looking for Rachel. According to Janet, she had to threaten to call the sheriff's department to get him to leave. In addition to interviews, authorities managed to track down multiple vehicles which matched descriptions of the Camaro, Trans Am, and white truck. These vehicles were examined and searched for evidence, including being examined by forensics teams, though nothing of any evidentiary value was discovered with a link to Rachel. Amongst the tips which were called in was one from a local high school student. According to this student, he and his friend had been in the area that morning, cutting class and driving around. But upon further questioning, extensive background checks, and examination of his vehicle, both he and the friend he had been with were ruled out of the investigation. Several miles from the Cook family home is Lake Georgetown, the lake has a depth of 85 feet at its deepest point and covers 1,297 acres. Searchers began to wonder about the possibility that Rachel may have ended up in the lake that day, either by her own choice or as the result of foul play. Dive teams were sent into the lake on multiple occasions, though all that was found were several submerged vehicles. Records checks on the vehicles indicated that they were stolen and had been stolen well before the date of Rachel's disappearance. It was ultimately decided that none of these vehicles were tied to Rachel or her disappearance. Over the years, Lake Georgetown has been searched many more times, but nothing connected to Rachel has ever been discovered. Composite drawings were put together based on eyewitness descriptions of individuals seen in the neighborhood the day Rachel went missing. 
These images were released to the media and ran in several papers and news broadcasts, though no calls came in to identify who these men may have been. Without any other suspects to look at, and with little evidence to go on, investigators went back to basics and began to examine the family, as well as Rachel's then-boyfriend, Greg, who had flown back into town to take part in search efforts. Greg was questioned by authorities in terms of his relationship with Rachel, any problems they may have had, whether or not she reported issues with anyone else. Ultimately, phone records verified that Greg had been in San Diego when Rachel disappeared, and he was cleared of possible involvement. After questioning both Robert and Janet, both parents volunteered to take polygraph tests. Janet passed without issue. Robert also passed but one question showed an issue. Robert later explained, quote, They asked me if I knew where Rachel was. I said no, and unfortunately, I think, I think I do. I think she's in heaven, so I think that's why I didn't pass that one question on the quiz. End quote. With nowhere to go, no leads, and no evidence to work with, the investigation began to grow cold. While investigators continued to work the case, they simply couldn't develop anything to give them a direction. Robert and Janet continued pressing for attention for the case, with both speaking to the media and becoming involved in the community more aggressively. Despite these efforts, the distribution of missing persons flyers and the raising of billboards bearing Rachel's image, months began passing and soon, the one-year anniversary of her disappearance arrived. At the time, the family began losing hope, and it was clear that Rachel's disappearance was having a dramatic effect on them. Both Janet and Robert elected to deal with things in their own way, with Janet needing comfort, needing someone to listen, and Robert withdrawing further and further into himself. As Janet sank deep into depression, she began seeking out counseling and medical help, while Robert pushed himself harder every day to track down his daughter. Ultimately, the couple divorced as their relationship deteriorated. The once happy family was forever shattered by the loss of Rachel, and the aftermath of her disappearance was simply too much to handle. As years began passing, a new sheriff was elected in 2004, and he made Rachel's case a priority. A task force was assembled, made up of sheriff's detectives, Texas Rangers, the Austin Police Department's Cold Case Unit, and the FBI. It was their goal to go over the case once again, to examine every detail, to find what may have been missed, and to hopefully discover the truth about what may have happened. Sadly, despite their efforts, little new information, if any, was found. The task force ultimately failed to develop new leads, and while their efforts had thrown Rachel's case back into the spotlight, the answers continued to evade authorities. Nearly four years would pass before there was movement on Rachel's case, and it would come in the form of a disturbing confession from a convicted killer. Michael Keith Moore was, at the time, serving four life sentences for the 2003 murder and robbery of Christina Moore and her son. He was a career criminal, with arrests spanning from 1992 to 2003, covering various crimes, from criminal mischief to robbery, kidnapping, and theft. In August of 2006, Moore confessed that he had been the man who abducted and murdered Rachel on that fateful day in 2002. According to his story, he had been driving around the neighborhood looking for someone to rob when he'd come across Rachel. In his confession, Moore admitted to murdering Rachel with a hammer and then dumping her body into Matagorda Bay, located far to the south along the Gulf of Mexico. Both Detective Hawkins and Investigator Lindemann visited Moore in prison to interview him about Rachel. According to them, he told a story about what had happened, how he had committed the crime, several locations he had taken Rachel, and ultimately where he had dumped her body. He agreed to show authorities several locations as part of a plea deal, which would net him only an additional 18 months on his sentence. 
Part of the deal included pointing out the area in Matagorda Bay where he had allegedly wrapped her body in a tarp and weighed it down with rocks. Divers entered the bay in the area specified by Moore, but on multiple occasions were unable to find anything. It was considered possible that Rachel's remains may have drifted, come unwrapped, or perhaps even that Moore didn't have his location precisely right. One detail about Moore which helped convince investigators of his guilt was that, at the time of Rachel's disappearance, he had been driving a white pickup truck, very much like the one witnesses had reported seeing in the area that morning. On November 9th, 2006, Moore was set to go before a judge and enter his guilty plea. At the time, it was going to be necessary for him to explain in detail before the court exactly what he had done. The courtroom was absolutely jammed that day, with Rachel's parents and sister present, friends, many members of the community, and the media. When the moment of truth came and Moore was asked how he pled, the air was completely sucked out of the room when he responded, not guilty. According to Moore, he had admitted to the crime only because it granted him special privileges while incarcerated, and he believed that investigators should have known by his story that he had been making it up as he went along. The Cook family was absolutely devastated. They had come all of this way believing they were finally going to get an answer, and according to Moore, he was merely using them to better his own position. The debate about whether or not Moore was involved continues to this day, and he contributed to that chaos by agreeing to interviews, backing out of them, claiming he was involved, and then claiming he made up the entire story. Robert Cook later stated, quote, He is a predator. He lives and breathes based on taking advantage of other people, and he used my daughter for his own gain. That's why he did everything. End quote. Hawkins and Lindemann were angry and frustrated, but in terms of Moore, the only information they had to go on was what he had told them. They had no real evidence, no witnesses, and nothing solid with which to tie him to Rachel's disappearance. It was a three-month-long exercise in futility, with Moore getting the better of law enforcement, for his own sick and twisted reasons. Unfortunately, the one potential break in the case which had risen was now gone. According to Hawkins, though, there was one tip which kept coming in through various individuals. The tip specified a large piece of land where it was suggested that Rachel's body may be buried. In an interview, Hawkins stated, quote, For the last three years, we get a continuous tip, as I call it, that Rachel is on a certain property. We've had multiple searches out there. It's just a continuous story we hear with a little twist each time comes back to the same people every time. We're going to keep looking at it. It's a very large piece of property, and we're hopeful. End quote. Over the years, several digs were conducted on this property. Authorities utilize ground-penetrating radar, but to this date, nothing has been recovered. In a tragic turn of events, Rachel's father, Robert, who had never given up the search for his daughter, and was living up to a solemn vow that he had made to find her, passed away due to natural causes on November 5th, 2014. The strain and stress of Rachel's disappearance had weighed heavily on Robert, and while it had forever changed the course of his life, he worked hard to fight not only for Rachel, but to protect others from a similar fate. He became an advocate for missing persons, helped organize self-defense classes for women all over Central Texas, and had been involved in searches for other missing persons in the area. He was heavily involved with keeping Rachel's story and many others alive in the media by giving speeches around the country at conferences and offering insight into not only the disappearances themselves, but the emotional impact of these terrible cases on the families. Robert never stopped searching for Rachel until the day he died. He was 59 years old. Several years would pass before another dig took place, this time in 2017. This particular property has been listed as being near Liberty Hill, 
with digging being performed near the San Gabriel River. The spot was described as being in a heavily wooded area at the bottom of a steep slope. Investigators dug for several hours in a 15 by 20 foot spot. The location is in a mobile home neighborhood and reporters described the land as being covered in discarded refuse. Sheriff Robert Cody stated to the media, quote, The tip was only specific to the fact that there were possibly remains of a human in that area, and the name Rachel Cook was brought up one time. We have no evidence to indicate, other than that one tip, that Rachel Cook was involved. End quote. Four cadaver dogs were brought to the site, and all four of them indicated the scent of human remains, but to date, nothing has been recovered. It has been theorized that the body may still be there, or that perhaps it may have washed away as the river in that area is known to flood. The family was once again heartbroken by the possibility of answers and the revelation that none were yet forthcoming. In April of 2018, the Williamson County Sheriff's Department received a tip regarding a white Pontiac Trans Am. Initial reports from the day Rachel disappeared described a white or blue Camaro or a white Trans Am in the area. Police had worked hard to track down these vehicles and believed that one may have been tied to teenagers cutting school that day. For investigators, there had been a group of people whom they considered persons of interest, and these individuals had a connection to the white Trans Am. A tip was forwarded to their cold case unit which directed them into the Dallas area, where they were able to recover the 1998 White Trans Am. A forensics team from the FBI combed over every inch of the vehicle, and in September of 2018, revealed that blood had been discovered on the passenger floorboard and passenger door. The full details of the test run have not yet been revealed, as the Sheriff's Department has stated that they are considered vital to the integrity of the investigation. When Janet was asked about this new development, she responded, quote, Maybe something will come of this, maybe not. We'll take it one step at a time. I know law enforcement are working hard on this case. I hope it's time. I'm not quite singing yet. End quote. I will now play a clip of Sheriff Cody giving the press a short briefing regarding the discovery of this vehicle. This is an actual code case. I know you want to see this case resolved, but rest assured, nobody wants this case more resolved than the Cook family, specifically Janet Cook. The day of the Rachel Cook disappearance, witnesses described a white passenger sports car that was seen in the area where she was jogging near her home. We have, in fact, located a vehicle that matches the description of the vehicle and had that vehicle, as you just saw, pull in as evidence in our custody. This vehicle will be processed immediately by the FBI for any potential evidence in the Rachel Cook case. What, did, what makes this vehicle unique is that this is also a vehicle that is tied with three to four persons of interest in the Rachel Cook case. I want to be clear on a few topics. This is one piece of evidence that may or may not break the case. But let me also be clear that this is a significant piece of evidence from our cold case unit that they locate. Regardless of the outcome, there will be a lot of work to be accomplished. As of today, this is where the case currently stands. The vehicle was discovered some six months ago. Forensic analysis was completed with reports returned in September. Many are hopeful that the evidence discovered in the Trans Am will result in arrests and possibly the discovery of Rachel's whereabouts. At this particular point in time, the answers remain unclear, and in the absence of solid evidence, several theories have been developed as to who may have been responsible for Rachel Cook's abduction. The first theory suggests that Rachel's disappearance is tied to her former boyfriend with whom she argued at a party just two days before she vanished. Proponents of this theory point towards the man's volatile relationship with alcohol and his insistence that Rachel needed to come back to him and he didn't want to live without her. 
The second theory connects to convicted murderer Michael Keith Moore, who confessed and later recanted his statement that he had been driving through the North Lake subdivision the morning Rachel disappeared. According to his now withdrawn confession, he had approached the young woman from behind where he viciously beat her with a hammer before taking her down to Matagorda Bay where he wrapped her in a tarp, weighed her down with rocks, and submerged her beneath the surface. The third and final theory in this case suggests that a group of individuals yet to be publicly identified was involved in Rachel's disappearance. Details surrounding this group have been scarce, but many believe that these particular persons of interest are likely those who were involved in Rachel's disappearance and that their connection to the White Pontiac Trans Am represents the newest and most prominent break in this case in the 16 years since Rachel vanished. When last seen, Rachel Louise Cook was described as being a Caucasian female with hazel eyes and blonde hair streaked with auburn. She stood 5 foot 2 inches tall and weighed between 110 and 120 pounds. At the time of her disappearance, Rachel was wearing a green sports bra, a gray shirt tied around her waist, gray shorts or sweatpants, and white shoes, either Adidas or Asics. She was carrying a bright yellow Sony Walkman and wearing headphones. Rachel has two heart-shaped cherries tattooed on her left shoulder and a black star on her left foot near her pinky toe. Her ears have multiple piercings and her navel is also pierced. She was last seen in the North Lake subdivision of Georgetown, Texas on January 10, 2002. Rachel's father went to his grave, never knowing what became of his beloved daughter. But her sister, mother, and many friends remain today, hoping and praying that the answers are coming and that whoever perpetrated this horrible crime will face justice sooner than later. It has been 16 years since Rachel vanished, and if alive today, she would be 36 years old. What life might she be living had someone not made the choice to forever change the course of history? Perhaps a mother? An aunt? A wife? Hopefully, soon the truth will be revealed, and Rachel may be returned home to her family, where they may have the ability to properly mourn her. And while closure may not provide them with elation, perhaps still it can grant them the peace necessary to continue to live in her honor. The disappearance of Rachel Cook is a tremendously heartbreaking story. A beautiful young woman loved by all who knew her, with a brilliant sense of humor and a sharp mind, makes the trip from her small hometown to Southern California. There, she meets and falls in love with a young man and together they begin to plan their future. While her family was worried about the dangers of her being in the big city, it would be her return home to Georgetown, Texas, that would ultimately lead to her disappearance. From the moment Rachel went missing, a family was forever shattered, and a sleepy southern community was inexorably changed. Rachel, born and raised in Georgetown, was known throughout the small town, and her disappearance still haunts those who knew and loved her. The investigators who have worked this case for the past 16 years refuse to give up hope, and to this day, tips continue to come in regarding what may have happened to Rachel. Unfortunately, much of the information which has come in has failed to lead to any discoveries. From the alleged false confession from Moore to recent recovery of the white Trans Am, the answers have yet to be fully uncovered. For Rachel's family, it's a difficult and devastating set of circumstances that led to the young woman disappearing while out on a run, one of her favorite activities. So many people go out running every day, and even while in the supposed safety of their own neighborhoods, there is no certainty that someone isn't out there lurking with evil intentions. In a case such as this, with little to no evidence available, and even the most rudimentary of crime scenes non-existent, it can be incredibly difficult to try and nail down exactly what happened. Law enforcement is almost entirely dependent on eyewitness statements and what tips do happen to come into their office. The Williamson County Sheriff's Department today 
is much different than it was 16 years ago. And while at the time it wasn't perhaps handled in the most efficient manner, today the men and women working on this case are dedicated to finding the answers and providing the Cook family with justice. In the absence of that justice, three theories have developed over the years about what may have happened to Rachel on January 10, 2002. The first theory examines the possibility that Rachel's former boyfriend may have been involved. Despite my efforts in researching this case, I could find no particular source which granted a name to this person of interest. His name is obviously known to the family and law enforcement, so perhaps there's a reason why it has never been released publicly. Either way, Rachel's ex-boyfriend seems to have been considered a likely candidate for her disappearance by not only friends and family, but members of law enforcement as well. It's fairly standard procedure to begin with a disappearance by looking at those who were close to the victim. In this case, we have a man that she dated who, all of this time later, was still apparently interested in getting back together with her. There are two separate incidents which have lent suspicion to this man. Firstly, the incident at the party where he was aggressively expressing his interest in getting back together with her. By all accounts, the ex-boyfriend made a scene at the party and wouldn't leave Rachel alone to the point that she had to be aggressive in dismissing him. At this point in her life, she'd already moved on with another man, was planning her future, and certainly wasn't interested in going backward in her relationships. It appears that, outside of some frustrating back and forth, this incident came to a conclusion when Rachel left the party. The second incident, also involving this man, came at a different point in time, and from what I gather, much closer to the time of the breakup, when he came to the Cook family home, drunk and belligerent, at approximately 3 a.m. According to Janet, the man approached the house, began banging on the door and calling out Rachel's name, while Janet explained to him that this wasn't appropriate and he needed to leave, the man refused to go, and it actually took Janet threatening to call the sheriff's department before he finally left their property. While it isn't uncommon for the partner who catches the bad end of a breakup to do some desperate things, this kind of behavior crosses into a world of danger and threats. It seems clear, especially after the party, that regardless of how much time had passed, this man simply couldn't let go of Rachel. Rachel was last seen just a few hundred yards from the family home. Her ex-boyfriend would have known where she lived and also likely known her morning routine of running. For many, they have believed that whoever committed this crime likely had a connection to Rachel and knew her well enough to be able to plot out just how to attack her. If this is true, then her ex-boyfriend would certainly be an interesting subject for suspicion. Their history, his inability to let go, and his knowledge of her location and usual routine would grant him the ability to be able to plot this out and execute it. The question becomes what exactly happened, and for many who support this theory, they believe that the ex-boyfriend either approached Rachel to once again discuss their breakup, at which point things went bad and violence ensued, or perhaps even that the man, now at the end of his rope, approached her specifically with the plan of abducting her. Unfortunately, outside of the incidents, there's no evidence to support this theory. No one reported seeing the ex in the neighborhood that day. His vehicle wasn't described, and he doesn't fit the composite drawings which were created. Police spoke with him on several occasions, and were never able to compile anything which would have given them the ability to arrest him for any particular crime. However, in a case where essentially everyone is a suspect, the ex-boyfriend is certainly someone who they continue to examine as best they can. It's been 16 years now, and people talk. Over the course of all these years, little if anything has come out about this man and his possible connection to Rachel's disappearance. While this is certainly a theory which should be thoroughly examined, without further evidence or information, it's a very difficult one to tackle. The second theory digs into the twisted and warped mind of convicted killer Michael Keith Moore. Moore has a long criminal history and certainly is no stranger to murdering a woman. At the time of Rachel's disappearance, he was out of prison and driving a white truck which matched descriptions given by eyewitnesses from the day Rachel vanished. 
The sheer fact that Moore later confessed to this crime, coupled with these witnesses, made him seem like a likely and viable suspect for this atrocious act. The problem is that, once Moore recanted his statement, there was no physical evidence or anything outside of his own words that law enforcement could use to prove that he was in fact the man responsible. According to his own story, Moore was driving around the North Lake subdivision that day looking for someone to rob. While doing so, he witnessed Rachel jogging. For some reason, which has never been explained, he made the choice to creep up behind the young woman, who had headphones on, making her ability to detect him less efficient, and wielding a hammer he struck and killed her. After murdering Rachel, Moore alleges that he then transported her body down to South Texas, where he wrapped her up in a tarp, weighted it down with rocks, and disposed of her in Matagorda Bay. It's never really made sense to me that a man looking to rob someone would instead jump to murdering a jogger. Joggers aren't often carrying sums of money around with them, and to commit this crime in a quiet neighborhood in broad daylight without leaving any blood behind definitely would be a brash and nearly impossible move to make. In addition to that, there are many wooded areas and locations between Georgetown and Matagorda Bay where he could have disposed of the body, so why drive all the way down there? Remember, Lake Georgetown itself was only a few miles away. Whether or not Moore's confession was legitimate, we may never truly know. He obviously possessed enough information to convince investigators, but it becomes a question of whether or not his information was on target, or if they were so interested in solving the case that they let some of the details slide. This is the debate about Moore. It's very clear that he had the ability and the capability to commit this crime, but without any evidence, it's difficult to say that this is what happened. Extensive searches of Matagorda Bay have failed to yield any results. And while it's possible that the tarp and rocks may have come undone, and Rachel may have drifted elsewhere, there's simply nothing to indicate that anything Moore confessed to was actually true. After entering his not guilty plea, Moore told the media that he had lied in order to get himself better treatment in jail and special privileges. That certainly did happen. But why would someone do this for short-time privileges when he would have to be aware that all of this would be taken away and his treatment would worsen once he recanted his confession? The entire situation is frustrating and difficult, but you're dealing with a sick and twisted individual whose choices are going to revolve completely around himself. Even after recanting his confession, Moore agreed to do interviews, and then pulled out of them. Famously, when Disappeared was recording their episode on Rachel's case, they went so far as to set up their cameras and equipment in the prison chapel, only for Moore to cancel the interview moments before it was to begin. Honestly, trying to get to the bottom of Moore's reasons for confessing, whether or not he was involved, and what exactly is going on here, is nearly impossible. It isn't uncommon for someone like Moore to take sick pleasure in toying with police and grieving families, and that may be exactly what happened here. We can't ignore eyewitness reports of a truck matching Moore's being seen in the area, and simply because he said he disposed of Rachel in Matagorda Bay doesn't mean that's what happened. Moore could easily have committed this crime and simply have done it in a different way with a different result. Unfortunately, Short of new evidence being discovered, or more giving additional information which can actually be verified, the possibility that Michael Keith Moore committed this crime and then used it for his own gain while in prison remains unable to be proven or disproven. This leads us to the third and final theory, that yet unnamed individuals were involved in this crime. Oftentimes when covering a case, the idea that a completely unknown suspect or suspects perpetrated the crime is a possibility, but in this case, it seems to be the prime possibility. While these suspects have never been publicly identified, based on the statements of law enforcement, it seems clear that they have been following their movements almost since the very beginning. This does little to assuage the frustration over the lack of information, but police have played this very close to their chests and have never wanted to reveal further details about these individuals. 
Based on new developments this year, police were able to impound a white Trans Am which matched the descriptions given by eyewitnesses from the day that Rachel vanished. This Trans Am has in turn been listed as being linked to this group of individuals that they have been looking at since early on in the case. The vehicle, coupled with the discovery of blood inside of it, certainly seems to spell out that something illegal had taken place. But for investigators, it's a matter of trying to tie this vehicle and its inhabitants to Rachel's disappearance, which at this point, they have not been able to successfully do. I wish there was more information about this particular theory available, but authorities obviously believe in it strongly enough that they don't want to take any chances of revealing too much too soon. From everything I've gathered, this group does not appear to have been directly connected to Rachel prior to her disappearance. It seems possible that these suspects were in the area, driving around at the time that Rachel disappeared. It would appear that the crime itself may have been entirely random, and in fact, that no one in Rachel's life played a role in it. If this is truly the case, that would certainly make the investigation much more difficult. When a crime is committed randomly, without real motives or a previous connection to the victim, law enforcement can have great difficulty narrowing down the possibilities. It doesn't follow any pattern. It doesn't connect to any established data. And sadly, in the case of Rachel Cook, this may have come down to a matter of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Some have suggested that these men may be tied to the plot of land that police have been digging in for years now, though again, without further information, that's not possible to verify at this time. Hopefully, soon, new information will be revealed, and the results of their examination of the vehicle will lead investigators to file charges, make arrests, and finally begin the process of getting justice for Rachel and revealing her whereabouts. Right now, it's a matter of time and waiting. That is certainly a frustrating set of circumstances to deal with, but it's already been over 16 years since Rachel vanished, and we can only hope that it won't reach 17. The theory regarding these suspects is certainly the most prominent, and their connection to the white Trans Am presents, for the first time in a very long time, the possibility that the answers are coming. Whether or not law enforcement is able to make the right connections remains to be seen, but their discovery of this vehicle came as the result of a tip which at a minimum suggests that someone out there knows a lot more about Rachel's disappearance than they are currently willing to share. The disappearance of Rachel Cook is a devastating case to examine. It's full of twists and turns, each bringing its own level of frustration and heartbreak. At the center of this case is a family, torn apart and shattered by the loss of a beloved daughter and sister. Georgetown, Texas has never been the same since that fateful day in January of 2002, and Rachel's name continues to be spoken amongst its citizens. Whereas once she was known as the polite, sweet, and beautiful young woman who lived just down the road, she is known now as a woman who vanished in a haunting mystery without an answer. Robert Cook passed away before he could see justice done for his daughter, but he dedicated the last years of his life to finding the truth and helping others. We can only hope that soon, the truth will be revealed, and the Cook family may finally know what became of Rachel. Pending the results of the current investigation, the discovery of new evidence, or a confirmed confession, the disappearance of Rachel Cook remains open and unsolved. If you're interested in finding more information about the disappearance of Rachel Cook, there are many websites and forums discussing her case. Disappeared did an episode on Rachel's case, and Unsolved Mysteries also did a segment on it. If you have any information about the disappearance of Rachel Cook, please contact the Williamson County Sheriff's Department or FBI. There is currently a $100,000 reward for information leading to the solving of this case. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, message me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, 
email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com or comment in the Facebook group. I want to give a special shout out to Patreon producers Krista Colvin, Amanda Lee Ruth Smith, Diane Dyson, Jordan V, Kate Alexander, and Megan Cotter. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate and review the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever podcast app you're using. The more ratings and reviews the show gets, the more people are able to hear these unsolved cases. For more information about other cases, transcripts, media, and more, please visit the website at trace-evidence.com. This completes this week's episode. I want to remind you that Trace Evidence is available on Spotify now, so make sure you go and check it out there. Also, please visit truecrimelist.com and give Trace Evidence a vote. It would certainly help grow the podcast, and I'd really appreciate it. Thank you for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.